And I think this issue of cultural diplomacy in the transatlantic relations is a very important one. Uh, in essence, uh, the, to quote the title uh, that we had actually decided on for this session, you are entering the American sector. U.S. forces in Germany and the cultural impact on transatlantic relations. If we look at transatlantic relations over the last few decades, uh, there was a high point, I guess, during the Cold War, many would say, uh, where there was a very large and significant American presence in Germany, uh, especially in Berlin. Uh, also, culturally speaking, at that time, for the United States, cultural diplomacy was very important. Uh, they had actually an institution called the America House all over Germany, uh, and it was a separate building basically dedicated to cultural diplomacy. Let's represent American culture, civil society, society through a separate institution. So in many ways, many look at that time period as a high point, uh, really where there was a big priority for the USA and to have Germany there, uh, to have a strong cultural relationship. Um, so I wanted to just talk to you maybe about what you think changed uh, as we look, let's say, historically at this very high point, let's say, during the Cold War, where really Germany was priority one, culture diplomacy was priority one. What happened? Uh, I think there, as we see from my point of view as an American, at the end of the Cold War, uh, and I'll be provocative here, and I can pick on the Americans a little bit since I am American, I think you could call it arrogance, you could call it a mistake, I don't know what it was, but the Americans essentially said, okay, mission accomplished. You know, Cold War is won, no more need. Let's close down the cultural diplomacy. Uh, they shut down all the America houses. Uh, they shifted the United States Information Service into the State Department. And from a German point of view, from my understanding, really pulled back. Uh, Alexander Langulius, you may know, the former politician here in Berlin who heads the uh, think tank, this um, Checkpoint Charlie Stiftung. Uh, I always quote him. He says, uh, Mark, relationships or friendships are not like light switches that you can turn on and off when you need them. You've got to send a Christmas card once a year. Uh, and I think many Germans at that time really felt as if the USA has stopped sending Christmas cards. Uh, and you see really a gradual pullback. So maybe just the opening question, uh, what do you think changed in this dynamic uh, as we see really from the Cold War period moving ahead uh, in, let's say, the importance of culture and cultural diplomacy to the transatlantic relations? So thank you for the question. It's, uh, of course, uh, uh, I could speak for hours about, about the questions that, that, that you set up. Um, it's a short word about why I'm here. It's a uh, um, since we will speak a bit about the history of transatlantic relations, I uh, uh, have the awkward feeling once in your life, sometimes it happens to you that you sit here because you're an eyewitness <laughs> of history. Um, but uh, that, that is because, uh, and we agreed on that before, I was born in Frankfurt, I was raised uh, um, in, um, in a region where American forces were uh, ubiqui uh, ubiquitous. They were uh, everywhere. They were um, uh, stationed in Frankfurt, in Eschborn, uh, there were my, my co-students in school, the, 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 the kids of, of the soldiers or the, the civilian uh, personnel, so they were all around. And so um, we started this whole, this whole topic um, from my thinking about how important that experience of having American neighbors and friends were in, in my life and from a personal cultural formation. When I look at the changes that, that, that we talk about, um, you could speak about history for hours, but it, it's worth to look back at the cultural relationships between Germany and America since the end of, of the Second World War. In the beginning, of course, Americans had, had quickly understood that they would need as many allies as possible in Europe to, to confront or um, uh, um, um, move back, push back uh, Soviet influence. And so it, th there was an interest to, to include Western Germany in, in the security structures of, uh, of um, 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 yet forming a uh, Western group of states. And in that period, uh, Americans uh, like controlled a lot of the political developments in Germany, controlled with, uh, um, with the, their, their special rights, the, the development uh, of a democratic system in Germany, the media, uh, the, the book market, the cultural, the cultural market as well. In that period, the Germans were quite happy to be on the Western side. They had a positive attitude towards the Americans with, with mixed feelings, we will come to that, um, uh, across the generations. But many of the old like German elites, uh, while um, embracing the new American approach, had uh, a negative image of America. You know, these were cultural barbarians. They had only 200 years of history. What can they tell us, you know? And, and so there was this mixed feeling of, of openness politically um, and, uh, and deep, deep rooted prejudices about what America really is. And so, so this kind of anti Americanism or amb ambivalent anti Americanism in this, in this phase uh, changed later on um, when, when it was be becoming more normal to be allied and, and, and befriended to, to Americans. 
but then it would be it would, would be more possible to criticize the Americans of what were they what they were doing abroad. So um, when you when you look at the high point of transatlantic relations, these were when tens of thousands of students walked the streets here in Berlin and protested against Vietnam, against imperialism, against uh, against American military uh, dominance elsewhere. And that was during the Cold War when we were relying heavily on, on, on a, an American nuclear uh, umbrella. So the peace movement in, in Germany, the skepticism towards the military was strong. And since America was was um, associated with military uh, dominance, with, uh, with military strategies, uh, with a, an, an asymmetric uh, dependence of the Germans on, on military protection, uh, it was easy to criticize the Americans for that. In the same time, those who protested wore blue jeans, were listening to, to Janis Joplin, uh, and, and so on. So it, it, was, it was a close connection to, to the American side of the rebellion as well. And, um, and this is, I think, an, an, an important point. We will come to how important rock and roll was for transatlantic relations. But uh, it's also a generational conflict that is the same on both sides. So it's creating this kind of, of solidarity of, of the younger people in the 50s and 60s uh, ac across the pond. Now, when we, when we move back in another quick jump to today, what has changed after the end of the Cold War? Mission accomplished is, is one thing. It could also be that the Americans said, look, we, we have the Germans in our fold. It's fine. The relationship is good. The friendship is there. We, 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 the, the Germans, the West Germans, and also so, uh, many of the Easterns are very happy that the United States of America were most helpful in the process of unification. And uh, in, in 1989, um, George Bush, the, the, the elder, had offered uh, a role of like uh, partners in leadership to West Germany, and that was unthinkable at that time. Um, but, but that was a, a real offer. And so they cut back that, that, that side of... Um, of foreign policy, the cultural side, because um, it was no longer needed to win over the Germans culturally. Um, and we, can, we can speak about Americanization of, of, of the German culture and the impact and influences that, that American culture and, and the commercialized American culture had on us. But I think that was an important move. And, and when, I, when I look at, I, I had plenty of talks with people who, who did the cultural diplomacy or the, um, that, that sort of foreign policy with uh, Iraq with uh, with countries uh, in, in the Islamic world, and all I could s tell them, look, do you have something like AFN? They said, no, we, we plan campaigns and we, we build libraries, and so it, it, it was more. Um, my, my feeling is that cultural diplomacy in the U.S. is more planned, more controlled, and uh, is not not so much a side product, a very effective side product of American presence. I have a question uh, related to rock and roll. Actually, I want to talk to you about post-Cold War, but you inspired me with your point there. Let's stay in the Cold War for a second. And I think there you just made the point in many ways for the Americans, culture diplomacy is more planned. To a certain degree, yes. Uh, we discussed earlier this week the famous example of the jazz ambassadors, uh, where the State Department would actually pay to send jazz ambassadors around the world to represent different aspects of American culture than just American policy. However, you raised a very good important point uh, regarding rock and roll. I think rock and roll is maybe an example where it wasn't so planned. Uh, were really there, you had this freedom of expression in the field of music with rock and roll that was really very, very successful. I quoted the other day one of our advisory board members, Ambassador Andras Shimioni. Uh, he's the former Hungarian ambassador to the USA. Uh, he's now at the John Hopkins University in charge of their Center for Transatlantic Relations. And he said very eloquently a few times, how as a child growing up in Hungary under communism, rock and roll had more of an impact on him than politics. Uh, as a musician, that was his language. That was how he communicated. That was how he also received ideas. So I just wanted to ask you about that. How important was rock and roll in the sense, was this just hard power, as Joseph and I would say, uh, or smart power? Or what impact do you think rock and roll played uh, in actually the end of the Cold War, or the, the closing of the Cold hard War? Hard rock would be hard power. Or <laughs> That's a debate. Okay. But, um, yeah. I think... Rock and roll was attractive because it was a symbol of rebellion in the U.S. Uh, and and in, in in Germany as well. A, bit, a little later, maybe, but but uh, with the same sort of mechanisms, a sort of of sexual emancipation, a sort of uh, uh, like interracial, interethnic uh, um, uh, play with with music. And so the reactions to rock and roll in Germany in the 1950s and, and, and uh, were like similar, racist. Um, uh, Again, like writing against female reactions to, to Elvis Presley. Um, um, it, it was an old generation trying to, trying to, to cope with, with that kind of phenomenon. 
um, and everybody will sure be over quickly. Um, and I think when I when I remember uh, and, and why I when we speak about planned and not so planned cultural diplomacy, when I remember how how that felt in Frankfurt. Um, um, I never, I've never been to a concert of, of a jazz ambassador or a rock and roll player ambassador or something like this. But uh, when, when you listen to AFN, when you the, the American Forces Network radio, um, that, that was the cool station, actually. It, it played much better music and more reliably interesting music than the, than the German stations. And, and that was, they, they were aware of that, but they were doing the music for the American Forces. And you had to go through the kind of boring... Uh, uh, like editorial parts for the American soldiers to come come to the music again, but you would do that. You would listen to AFN, and um, and I think uh, um, that and the fact that rock and roll is English is a very important uh, important uh, element. You could understand what they were singing. You could train your English with that. I mean, there are some some like more embarrassing rock and roll albums that I know by heart that I can sing under the shower if I want because I learned English with them. You know, um, and I can cannot impress anyone with that knowledge today, and it blocks my, my mind. But, but whatever, it's it's there. So so we, we you you would use that that kind of music to to, to um, like build your own identity on it and your own abilities in English. And when we come back to Frankfurt, um, when there was a concert, for instance, by ZZ Top or like big American bands, in. Uh, in, in Frankfurt, I think the Soviets could have taken the city quickly because every American soldier was around. And that was what, w I mean, you, the, the American soldiers were there. They, they, you, were, you weren't really close to them in many ways. So, so um, I, I don't remember like, having like, direct friendships with American soldiers, but there were many, many um, connections between, between them and, <coughs> and, and the German society. Um, it, you would simply go to the same bars. In Frankfurt, there's an it's a, it's a, um, um, uh, entertainment Quarter in the south of, of the River Main, it's called Sachsenhausen, and there are many, many bars, and, and there have been many more bars and music bars when the American soldiers were there. They, we had 150,000 American soldiers in Germany, many of them uh, in, in Frankfurt and around, and so, so like every bar had a house band playing southern rock or rock music or something like this, and this was everywhere. And so the blues scene in Frankfurt, blues and rhythm and blues, was very vivid, uh, and still is. Uh, other than in, in Berlin, for instance, we, we, we had soldiers here, but not that many, and, and there were like other um, uh, uh, other forces deployed, the French, the and, and the Brits. Um, but in Frankfurt, that was everywhere. It was a very musical city, and so when you ask me how important was rock and roll, it's, uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, how important is the air you breathe? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it has been around, and uh, um, I think uh, when I speak of planned and and uh, um, and, and uh, versus byproduct of cultural diplomacy, uh, I think to have American forces there, to, 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 to hear the, uh, the to, to see their cars in the streets actually, you know? In the 1970s, an American car was about as, like, double the size of a, of a German car. Uh, and I, I, I remember my mom, I was, was eight or something, and I, and I said something, something uh, enthusiastic about an American car, and I, and I, and I was, Totally crazy about big Cadillacs and Pontiacs and 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 all that and, and she was she was putting me down she's nearly slapping my head can you shut up sh shut up look at a German car over here why do you why do you speak about American cars so much <laughs> so but that was that was the way we understood that America was was uh, uh, America was present and we understood that America was bigger and more interesting freer maybe uh, so a very complex set of symbols mm -hmm. starting with rock and roll but also with others. Combined with the like overall presence of American TV in, in, in on, on the TV shows, I would I would meet with a friend when we went to school and we would exchange uh, uh, our views of the latest episode of Cold Seavers or Magnum or whatever came came on TV the night before. And I remember when I was first in the U.S., uh, I nearly cried because I was I was really moved actually when I heard the first American police car and understood that it actually had this kind of. Because in Germany, the, the, the signal would be completely different. And I, and I knew by heart how this would sound. It, that was an environment that I knew so well just from TV. You know? So Americanized, rock and roll played a role, but, but also like, other symbols of American life present in Germany.
Excellent. Before I give the microphone to the audience, I want to give maybe fast forward for a moment to the transatlantic relations today. Uh, let me give you a brief summary from my side of what I think happened since the end of the Cold War. I'd love to get your reaction. I'll be a little bit provocative. And then I want to ask you a question about the current status of things. My father actually sent me an email yesterday with a video parody of the Obama um, Merkel relationship, uh, which is very funny, sort of this, this love affair, quote unquote. And you could even say maybe uh, you could look at the American German relations even as a marriage. Uh, so let's use this analogy for a second. So during the Cold War, I think there was a marriage there. Uh, it was almost, let's say, you know, a spouse to spouse relationship, very, very close. I would argue what would happen at the end of the Cold War, again, I'll be a little bit provocative, but I think out of arrogance, the Americans said, okay, you know, we're married for life. In the sense, Germany, they like us, they're friends with us. Second World War, Cold War, German Marshall Plan, you know, falling and reuniting Germany. Of course, Germany's gonna like us. Of course, Germany's gonna agree with us. Of course, Germany's gonna support us. And I, I would argue, again, I'm being a little provocative, almost arrogance, they said, okay, uh, let's, we don't need the America houses. We don't need all of this, and they pulled back. Uh, so that's a, a little bit provocative statement on that side. On the other hand, you have people like Ambassador Holbrook, who actually at the end of the Cold War had very interesting ideas and said, look, this is the time for a new tradition. Uh, the previous tradition was more almost a military tradition where there was a military presence here. Now that chapter has ended. We have a new chapter. Uh, the new tradition that must begin is this cultural bridge. And he actually started something called the New Traditions Network, which is still alive today. And it's actually a network of NGOs, civil society organizations dedicated to a stronger transatlantic relations. Uh, your, your organization is a member. We're a member. American Academy, Asset Institute, many civil society organizations that are working every day to strengthen these relations. And I think there to f fast forward, uh, in the period, let's say 10 to 15 years after the Cold War, I think things were more or less okay in the sense you had a relatively good functioning uh, of the relations. Then we had September 11th. Uh, we had the Bush administration. We had Iraq. We had Afghanistan. And that really brought us to a low point. And I think it was the second to last year of the Bush administration. They did a public opinion poll around the world of the USA. Germany, I believe, was, I don't know, 8% positive opinion of the USA. Iran at the time, was 22%. So Iran actually liked the US more than Germany did uh, at that time. And obviously that had a lot to do with the foreign policy at the time, but there was a low point. So I think we really, we see kind of a decrease, we see a low point there. Uh, then Obama is elected. Uh, and as an American living ab abroad, that was really a almost emotional experience. Before, I had to always apologize for my identity. I'm American, but I didn't vote for Bush. I'm not for the war. And then it was okay in a public space or a cafe to have a conversation with someone when they heard the American accent. When Obama was elected, it was the other extreme. Uh, suddenly, they'd hear the American accent. Yes, we can. You know, almost euphoric, almost maybe too high expectations. Uh, and then we see that also has, again, you could use this analogy of a marriage or a love affair. The emotions are going back and forth from that high point. Uh, now there's suddenly disappointment. Uh, then suddenly, the NSA is, spy is spying on the cell phone of Angela Merkel. And all of these issues going back and forth. So my question to you is, is first of all, I'd love your reaction on that kind of brief summary of things. Uh, I would argue today we're at another low point uh, in the sense, really, you don't have trust uh, between America and Germany for many reasons, whether it's NSA, spying, et cetera. Uh, you have a lot of really serious problems that nobody's really doing anything about, whether it's Syria, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Russia. Uh, I'd love to hear your reaction on Russia as well. The German-Russian relations are a very special one, relatively close one traditionally. The American-Russian relations are very complex as well, and I think especially Especially with what's going on now with Putin in the world, you see very different standpoints. Uh, and so my, my first question is, uh, what is the status of things right now? Are things as bad as I think they are uh, for the transatlantic relations? And secondly, what role does Russia play uh, in maybe making this even more complex? So when, when you start talking about the marriage analogy in, in, in German-US relations, I, I can't, can't help to, to Develop that, that image that it might have been a 1960s marriage with a wife nearly, not, not really allowed to, to, to do anything in, in, in they public they left life her at home in the beginning. It. And then suddenly she, she starts earning money and the, and, and the husband gets, uh, gets uh, um, puzzled that she's now more independent. And, uh, and uh, suddenly she's developed her, her own cultural ideas and, and, and does things elsewhere and, and uh, demands that kind of emancipation. And, and uh, um, in the end, the husband might get it, it comes close to getting kicked out, and then he um, he, he takes uh, t takes it up to him like maybe to lose weight or to to, to change his behavior to bring, bring flowers every day. <laughs> but he's still the same old bugger, you know. <laughs> and she knows that. So we, you, you could think along along these lines that, that also in a marriage th 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 things might be developing. Uh, now with the, uh, the the situation as it is right now the, the important thing is that germany is no longer a weak state quite the opposite it's the strongest and, and uh, most most powerful state in europe although we might as germans have problems with accepting 
what power means and what, what leadership or responsibility would mean. But uh, uh, everybody sees us as one of the crucial partners in Europe, not only because what, what the Germans are saying is, uh, uh, is, is important and, and relevant when it comes to solving the Euro crisis or the development of the, of the European Union, uh, but also because we have like, important ties to China, to Russia, to Iran, to all the countries uh, uh, in the Middle East. You know, It's very important what the Germans are doing, and this is why America is so much interested in us. Um, uh, so th the state of the art right now is that um, we will come down to, a, I hope, a more interest-based, sober relationship. The frustration of the Germans about the spying, the NSA scandal, um, is to a large degree uh, one of frustrated love and emotion. Um, and, and many people can't make a difference between friendship and friendship when they talk ab about the interpersonal level and, and the state level. You know, the friends don't spy on each other. And I would agree that, that states shouldn't spy on us, but uh, um, it, it's not like your personal friend would do the same on, uh, to, to you in the backyard or in, in, in the neighborhood. So a bit more, a bit more sober attitude, a bit, a bit more interest, uh, focus, would be good for the for transatlantic re relations, and I think the Americans have it, and we should develop it, the Germans. Um, when it comes to um, solving this problem with the NSA and, and, and to bring back some of the, 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 the trust that has been there earlier, I think this is very difficult. We would need some, some gesture similar to the one that Obama did in January when he was um, like issuing this, this presidential directive, when he was starting the campaign, rolling out a campaign to, to better tie in the NSA in the American Secret Service uh, system, uh, when he was like, reaching out to the Germans with an interview in, in, in German public TV, uh, very friendly. The Germans still like him a lot, uh, although they understood that, that yes, we can, doesn't mean more than yes, we will try. Yeah. And, um, and so, so uh, some visible gesture should be there. If you ask me, uh, President Obama should actually make clear that, that his spy organizations shouldn't spy on parliaments as they do in America, as they did in Germany. They shouldn't spy on, on, on uh, constitutional uh, organs like the Bundestag or the, the, the procedures that democracies have to, to uphold political control of, uh, of, uh, of the military, the police, and the secret services. I think that this should be a taboo that would be acceptable to like, the leader of the democratic world. And I, and I think this is one of the sectors where we could like, demand some kind of gesture. In, when I, when I look at, at the overall attitude in Germany, also looking back to the, to the um, years before the Iraq crisis, there's always a sort of anti-Americanism anti in Germany. There's always been, and I talked about this. Um, you, can, you can always find people who, who um, detest what America is doing internationally, who, who don't like American culture, who, who don't like the commercialization that comes with it. Um, and in times of crisis, these people or these, these opinions um, have a push. I remember in 2002, 2003, um, when I was, I was not for the Iraq war, I, wasn't, I, I was simply for, for being a bit more pragmatic in, in handling the, 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 um, the threat from, from Iraq. And each and every talk with friends would end in a shouting match in the end because everybody was sure that they, well, what the Americans are doing is wrong and everybody that who is demanding um, like German participation is a warmonger, and uh, we knew this from uh, from the start because the Americans are always trying to force others uh, in, into their will, and so like many many like aspects of traditional anti-Americanism came up, and this is also true when we look at the very arrogant reaction from from Washington uh, to the NSA scandal. Um, you will find a lot of anti-Americanism here, and as always, currently. You can make points by with, with anti-American uh, arguments. You can make points by headlines that, that, that uh, stand up against the Americans simply because the frustration is so high. And this is a very bad precondition this, that, that you can actually win politically by, by like supporting this mistrust. This is very bad for projects that we need to do. For instance, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership or a joint handling of the Ukraine-Russia crisis or joint uh, um, uh, approaches to the, to the Middle East. So when it becomes, um, when it's no longer beneficial, when it, when it becomes 
uh, disadvantages to, to cooperate with Americans in, in these fields politically at home, uh, these projects are in danger. And, and when you look at TTIP, for instance, many of you will, will know a bit about this, the attitude in Germany is very critical, although such a project will bring many, many economic uh, um, benefits for, for, for Germany, and it needs to be negotiated first because before you can criticize how bad it is. But um, nobody understands that this is a process. Nobody understands that, that um, we can negotiate from a very strong position and, s and, and, and uphold our standards. And, and when, when you look at, at, at uh, like some, some comments on, on TTIP, it, it, you have an um, impression that, that uh, uh, Darth Vader is negotiating with Sauron on, on free trade, actually. When you all these dark clouds and the dangers looming, you know, it's very ridiculous. But this is because you, you can, you can, you can um, um, like uh, kick the Americans and, and, and people will find it okay. What about Russia? What impact is Russia having now on the um, relations? On, on Russia, this is an interesting point. Um, I think the Germans have a very close connection to Russia. And uh, they're, they're throughout the board, across the party lines, there will always be many who say, we cannot have European security with Russia uh, unhappy with it. So we, we need to tie in Russia. We must have ways to, 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 um, to cooperate with Russia. And for many, economic interdependence and, and close cooperation is a very helpful s strategy to avoid war. And they're, they're, I, I, I still think this is true because Russia has not invaded Germany. Russia is not, is not like looking for a, a new Cold War. What it's doing is regional policy. But the trust or the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the benefit of doubt that, the, uh, that many Germans ha have, have given Russia is gone. Because Putin has lied, Putin has a very offensive, uh, aggressive foreign policy in, 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 its na in, in the Russian neighborhood. And uh, I think this is, has been very frustrating for many of the pro-Russians in Germany. And here come the, come the Americans. Uh, US has always tried to, to like pull out Germany from, from the close like, ties with Russia. Always demanded more in, in, in independence of the Germans, for, for instance, in energy, uh, from the Russians, and simply because that was th they understood that this is, in terms of an overall confrontation with Russia that might come, it's a problem that Germany is so close to the Russians. And what m much of the conflicts, or many of the conflicts that we see now follow these lines. But what America is doing with Russia is not starting a new Cold War, really. I mean, they, the, the Americans are trying to, to impose tougher sanctions. They try to do what's whatever possible to, to stand up as a leader of a democratic world. They send 150 soldiers to the Baltic states, to the, to the Poland each. And, and, uh, but, but, but they don't really like, try to tie in Ukraine into NATO as a member. They don't, they don't like, go to the front and fight. So what America is doing is, 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 is still moderate. Uh, and so the, the area of compromise between Germany and America isn't small. So what, whatever we hear about conflicts and that the Europeans are, are slow with sanctions, now finally we have them. It took time because the, Europe, the Europeans are those who pay for them. I mean, the, the for, for, for America, it's not as expensive, actually, uh, to, to accept sanctions to, to, to Russia. For, for Europe, it is. And now we have come to that point, and I think this also, uh, this is a positive sign, if you ask me, for, for transatlantic uh, uh, ability to cooperate. Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to now give you a chance to ask questions and comments. I'd also say those in the back who are standing, please come to the front. We have some seats here, uh, just also in preparation for our next speech, uh, State Secretary Silberhorn. As always, if you could raise your hand, and then when posing the question, if you could stand and then briefly introduce yourself, would be excellent. I see the first hand is here. Do we have another microphone in the audience? Yes, coming. And uh, everyone, feel free. You can come all the way to the front, yeah, and then go over in the corner. Should be plenty of seats. Okay, and we're here too. Okay, so we'll start in the audience, and then I'll come to you, Betsy. But I think the microphone is there. Okay, please. Hi, my name is Juliane. Um, I was born actually in the Russian sector to stay with the with the headline. Um, and obviously, I um, haven't seen uh, American soldiers in my neighborhood during my childhood. Neither have I seen Russians. <laughs> um, but just to explain probably the background of my question. Um, during your discussion, it was you were referring on some point that there might be a distinction between both governments and the public. 
and I would like you to explore probably a bit further of it because um, like if you if you talk about the perception of the US or the uh, um, or Germany in both directions um, it probably it's probably very different on the political level than to the to the people per se because like what you said about all the values like freedom and like openness and open-mindedness of the US um, and what we see today like what they what they actually um, live out these days is quite the opposite like seeing the NSA spying and so on um, I think this is what people actually reject as well that they don't live up to their own standards anymore uh, and that freedom or the 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 sales of peace it's actually not what they're doing I would like to yeah make the distinction on the political and and um, like people's level um, and how you see that thank you do you want to take a few of them yeah. or you can again first? okay let's take a few so maybe Betsy next because you could just somebody could help with the microphone maybe yeah, okay it's on its way okay. uh, could you come to the front of the microphone just uh, Betsy had a question so. <laughs> And then we'll take maybe one or two more as well. And okay. Hi, um, I'm Betsy. I'm a master's student here at the ICD. Um, regarding anti-Americanism, I read a book recently about the student movements during Vietnam. And I know there was a lot of cooperation between the student movements in uh, the United States and in Germany. Um, and actually, the student movement in Germany, Germany was really inspired by what the student movement in the States was doing. And then going all the way back to, to World War II, I mean, I think there was a general hope when the war was ending that the Americans would be the ones, you know, to enter, enter the towns from what I've read um, in comparison to the Russians. And so I feel like at first there was more of an anger at American policy. And then in later years, it kind of became more of a prejudice towards Americans themselves and what they represented. Do you think that there was a point um, where that was the case, where it kind of turned more from prejudice against American policy towards prejudice against Americans for being Americans? Is there maybe a third question for the first round or comments? Okay, please, if you, Betsy, if you could just hand the microphone. Okay. You have to turn it on, actually. So like that. Uh, hello, my name is Iman. I finished my master in public policy and uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Rico. I just want to know um, uh, what do you think is the effect of what is going on in the Middle East uh, on the transatlantic relation? And uh, also to mention uh, if uh, countries like China or India have uh, some weight also on this relation or, or can... Yes, thank you. I will we'll start with uh, the, the first question um, on um, the relationship between el elite attitudes towards America and, and the people's attitudes. Um, we can make it a little bit more complex even uh, because when we speak about anti-Americanism and attitudes towards America, uh, many people have very positive attitudes towards the Americans. And I, I would still say that for many, the, U the USA is, uh, is a beacon of hope, is a, is a, um, a focal point for um, for personal development, for freedoms, for, uh, for, for, for ways to live. I think that this, this attitude that was big, of course, during the Cold War uh, has seeded away a little bit. Um, but, but many have, have, uh, have problems with, with American policies and the government policies. Uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen a period where uh, um, transatlantic relations were free of conflict, even in the Cold War when it was asymmetrical. Um, there was always always haggling about uh, how, how Germany should approach Russia or Poland, uh, how they should whether they should should like trade uh, um, with with the Soviet Union, whether we, we should export like pipeline elements to the Soviet Union, strengthen the Soviets strategically. Um, so there, there was there were always always problems on that, but it, it was um, I think. On, on the level of the political elites, um, it has always been a clear priority that the relationship to America in a multilateral setting of NATO is at least as important as the friendship to, to France in the multilateral setting of the European Union. And 
um, when you look at the, the problems that you have, everybody would, would repeat to the point of being boring how important it is to do things together and that you can't solve problems al al alone, that you need to, to do this together with the Americans. So um, I think we have a rather um, strong consensus um, throughout the parties that, that, uh, that America is, is important on, on the elite level. And um, I think you, you, will, you will find more like critical notes. Why are we doing this? Do we really, we really have to, to, like, to dance when the, when the Americans are, uh, are piping? Do we, do we really have to, to be, um, to, to sit in America's lap dog, uh, 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 to, to be America's lap dog? Do, do, do we really have to, to allow American companies, for instance, to, um, to, to make life difficult here in Europe with their, with their standards and their demands on investor protection? So, so you, will, you will find a lot of frustration, uh, as in every asymmetrical relation, um, on, on, on the level of, of, of the, 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 the normal people. But it's, it's always ambiguous. I mean, we're in an Americanized culture um, with uh, like many, many Germans traveling to the US, many students still traveling to the US and, and studying there. Um, of course, the direct contact of American forces here and the culture they bring with them is gone, or um, not, so, not so prevalent anymore uh, th or throughout Germany. But uh, I think there is still, um, there is still an overall positive attitude, but with this with this experience that America stands for um, drone wars, for um, like uh, military hybrids that you can solve conflicts by by invading countries, for Guantanamo. I mean, these are symbols that, that there is another America that not, that not everybody likes, or most people don't like, and so so this complex relationship has become a bit more difficult, actually and uh, a bit more difficult to build upon. Uh, I don't know whether this answers your question, but um, um, my, my, my understanding is that, that um, the political level is, is um, anxious to keep the ties closed. And the, the lack of reaction from, from Merkel, for instance, to the early stages of the NSA scandal, where, we, where she was sitting on her hands and people were, were, were like mocking her, actually, is for me a sign they understood that Americans wouldn't wouldn't move anyway. They would, you wouldn't get this gesture that you could sell as a political win uh, in this conflict. Um, they didn't really know at that point how close the German secret services were entangled uh, in, in um, this kind of, of metadata collection. Um, they didn't didn't really know what um, what the Americans uh, had done all in all in Germany, and, and they, they, they knew that they wouldn't know and they couldn't present that. So very difficult to make political points then. Only when Merkel's handy was, or uh, so cell phone was, was in the, um, uh, was, was, in <coughs> was found to be in the American that she had to do something. And then she turned angry, you know. She was frustrated, but everybody was mocking her. I think the, the, the funniest tweet was, uh, okay, Angela, don't worry if you haven't done anything young or wrong, you don't have to worry about that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but, but still, even when she says now, it's a waste of, of energy, what we do now. That we try to, to, to come to terms with, with, uh, with the spying. We have to do so many important things. I think this is the attitude, not only of Angela Merkel, but also of, of, of many of the others. And uh, I think the, 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 the general public, although being positive towards the Americans, uh, they wouldn't want Germany to go anywhere the Americans are leading. Um, I think. Um, that is an interesting question because I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't see that there has been a shift or, or, or change of priorities between the two. There has always been a positive attitude towards America and towards um, uh, American way of life, the, the liberties that were connected to, the, to, to it. I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, the German, German life was pretty stuffy and, and, and like spießig and very, um, you know, um, narrow. Like the, the the way the Germans lived, not only that they were like poorer and, and, and um, of course had to, to, <coughs> to suffer from from the damages of the war and all that, um, but but it, Germany was was small, you know, and smaller, and and uh, life was hard, and America was a promise, and I, I believe that of course this is no longer this this important aspect of it, but the positive attitude of the uh, of America is still there. What has changed always is, is in the in the course of changing is that um, many people are becoming more and more critical about American society. You know, when you listen to, to how important like religion is, 
that, that is something that the Germans don't understand. And how it, how it is now becoming an important factor for policy um, that, that you can, can um, yeah, that you must cope with like uh, strangely right-wing, re religiously based extremist views, radical views uh, in everyday politics in the US is very difficult for the Germans to swallow. And um, to understand, um, or it's very, very difficult to, 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 uh, to like a society that is so polarized, that makes it it's so difficult to, to make political decisions, you know? People understand that it's the polarization in, in Washington that makes it difficult for Obama to, to carry out any of his, of his promises. But um, it's also the society that is leading to that kind of, of attitude. And, um, I mean, what is a country that doesn't want uh, Medicare? You know, it's something that the Germans are enjoying very, very much. So, so um, we, we live well with that. Why don't the Americans like it? It's kind of strange, you know. Um, I don't know whether you could speak generally about that, but I think um, many of these, these aspects of, of American society, also after 9-11, um, um, the, the willingness to protect themselves. Uh, it, it's for a normal German who is not traveling to, to the U.S. frequently, it's hard to understand that, um, what, what a trauma that was. And and wh why are they now suddenly like building up a police state uh, when they were like designed as a uh, liberal country um, on uh, the Middle East and China? Um, um, America, Europe, and the Middle East have always been th th that's been a very difficult difficult relationship. I think the, the Europeans, although this is more our neighborhood, and and we have to we have historical ties to the countries of the Middle East. Um, America, as the superpower, has always been uh, in charge in, in solving problems diplomatically. And uh, the frustrated efforts of, of Kerry now, or, or the Americans in general, to, to bring Israel uh, in line or to, to, to like win over anyone for a negotiated solution is also very frustrating for, for the Europeans and the Germans. Um, but they're also... They, they, don't, they don't really see themselves in a position to, to step in and to do what the Americans can't accomplish. I think Germany has very good relations to many of the Arab states. Uh, it is accepted that Germany has the very special relation to, to uh, Israel, with um, um, the security of Israel being, being part of, uh, of our uh, like state rationale in foreign policy, whatever that means in the end. But... Uh, uh, that it's very difficult in Germany to, to openly criticize Israel for what it's doing. But um, the, the Arabs accept that when it comes to accepting Germany as a, as a broker. Um, so I think there have, there have been some, some like diplomatic efforts where Germany could, could play a role. But uh, I think um, um, the, the Europeans are shying away. Also, also because the Europeans themselves are not, are not united in, in, in what to do with, uh, with, with the Middle East. On China and other countries, you will find patterns uh, um, when, when it comes to, to tying in and containing China militarily, the, Re the Europeans don't want to play a role. They want to do business, and they want to have a stable, stable regional order, but they, they've, they're, they're, not, they're not crazy about like, assisting America to, pl to, to build up a Western presence in the, in the Asia Pacific or so. Um, but because Germany has so good relations with China and because China is interested also to win over Germany, partly to split the European front, if there is one, or partly to split Western unity, um, it's also very interesting for the Americans to understand what, what, uh, what uh, Beijing and Berlin um, do, what they talk about, what they have in common. Let's take maybe one more final question, and then I'm just going to run down and greet our next speaker in the meantime. Is there one more final question or, or comments? Let's maybe go to the participants first. Maybe two. Uh, two in the front for the participants. And then we do have to conclude because the speaker's here. If someone could help with the I'm microphone. talking too long. Sorry. Uh, we'll, and we'll take these two questions and then the response. Um, hello, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this debate, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, of course, obviously, uh, very rich, uh, but I cannot uh, tackle all the points. But I would like to focus on a point uh, you actually mentioned uh, concerning uh, building allies yeah. uh, with Europe. And obviously, uh, Germany is one of the strategic allies of the United States, uh, either politically or uh, uh, economically, uh, as far as uh, like decision-making is concerned in the UN. Uh, my question is, I'm going to use a little sim symbolism here. 
I've, I've always looked, and this is my personal point of view, I have always looked at the, uh, let's say, the world uh, uh, polit uh, affairs as a, as a car. I looked at the economy as, a, as the engine, mm -hmm. politics as oiling of the engine, and culture as the design. It's the outside. It's what people appreciate. It's the, the painting. It's the colors and everything. Mm -hmm. But what really matters is the economy. So I think what makes Germany one of the strategic alliance of the United States is the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of politics involved, which is the oiling, is, is happening behind doors. And that's what most of people, let's say the majority of people, don't see. And that's why sometimes certain things happen and, 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 and it's very difficult to understand. Like, why would the United States spy on Germany? Uh, we would understand spying on other uh, countries mm -hmm. for security reasons, but I don't really think that Germany stands as a threat to the United States. So my question is, uh, I would like to focus on cultural diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the United States is close somehow and near to Germany because of culture, because I think there is uh, a small distance as far as uh, cultural traditions and customs is are concerned. <coughs> uh, and I think there is a big distance between United States and, and uh, uh, Middle East. So my question specifically is, is it because of culture, the distance, the cultural distance between uh, uh, the United States and parts of the world that, uh, let's say, defines uh, the allies, or is it other reasons that we are not aware of? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, uh, thank you for this uh, discussion. Uh, please, uh, when it comes to the spying crisis, it is really a, a crisis. And I am uh, really uh, flabbergasted with the way you are degrading it into a, a problem. Because it's not a, a personal problem between Obama and Merkel. Mm -hmm. It's a really a, a real crisis in the international relations, especially the German and the United States relations. Mm -hmm. Why it is a, a crisis? Because it will always remain. Uh, uh, it is a violation of international law, and I would like you to mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk a little bit about this. And it is also a, 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 an ethical violation because it will, uh, uh, you know, stretch the, the the gap between the German and uh, and the Americans. Uh, there is also one uh, thing I would like to 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 know concerning uh, uh, what is the real and ultimate objective of the international of uh, uh, the German and the United States for international relations. I uh, uh, would like you also to talk a little bit about uh, the Middle East, because I am from the Middle East. I feel I am from the Middle East. I would like you to talk about the, the, the emerging problems. Now, how far there will be a future challenge in terms of, uh, uh, in this context. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. so, so these are these are many questions. I could if it's a short question, I can, can, can take it, but I want to have time to answer, and somebody might just come up, and I have to, to run away. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Ibrahim Faro Hassan. So I am a student at the University of Leiden in Netherlands. So I have uh, one quest question for you in Dutch uh, here. So this time we see uh, an economic crisis in Europe. So what are the economic vectors, resources playing a role in the current crisis in Europe, in Germany? Um, I'm not an economist so much, so I, I might be might be very very uh, simple in answering uh, answering the last question on uh, on allies and values. I mean, they, uh, I liked your image a bit, but I was I was uh, uh, like uh, irritated that there's no one on the steering wheel actually. <laughs> so um, if you have a strong engine and uh, and a nice lubricant and a great color, uh, and then the car is running anywhere, it, it might be might be of danger as well. But um, um, the, the idea is, of course, that, that uh, um, the, the, the most important driver is the economy. And in transatlantic relations, the ec economic base is very, very strong. Like half of the, 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 the global economic output is created between America and Europe. And uh, the, the two are each other's trading partner to a far, far higher degree as, for instance, with, uh, uh, with, with, with other of, of the BRICS states. I think with China is, is coming, coming close, but uh, 
but it's still, I think, uh, uh, transatlantic relations, especially when it comes to investment, is, is very, very dense. Now, um, is a value base important, or, or common, an overlapping value base important for, for building allies? Um, in between Germany and America, I would say the alliance has come first, and that was dictated by historical conditions. Um, the value base in Germany was, was in shambles after the, the Second World War because many had believed in an ideology that, that turned out to be uh, um, false and dangerous and massively um, violent. And, and um, facing what, what had happened in, in, in the Second World War and uh, under the Nazi, Nazi rule, uh, the Germans had come to question everything that they thought was, was German in the first place. And there were, of course, Democrats that had remained in Germany and, and, and had played a, a, sec a secondary role that now came to the fore, but, but they all were, were like puzzled about what had happened. And so the values that the Americans were offering um, uh, was something some, or a set of values that the Germans liked to take up as uh, an alternative and as a way to prove to the rest of the world that they were no longer Nazis, no longer fascists. So when, you, when it comes to um, like rule of law, for instance, uh, that is, of course, something completely different than the 12 years before. Uh, when it comes to, to like uh, equality, democratic participation, um, in, in building on those values, of course, including market economy, um, the Germans like um, said goodbye to, or wanted to, to like con convey the signal that they would say goodbye to to, to, to their, their, their Nazi, uh, Nazi past. Now, um, I think in, in many ways the alliance was stable because the political conditions were forcing it to be. And after the, the Second World War, when, when NATO was able to adapt itself to new tasks uh, and to, to be more an organization managing um, a shifting security landscape in Europe and offering partnerships and memberships and, and cooperative structures, the Germans are very much behind that. And, and so there were good reasons, smart interests, so to speak, um, to, to support that, that kind of alliance that uh, America and Germany had. So um, I always like it best when um, it's not personal relationships like Kohl or, or Gorbachev or others, uh, but, but, but like stable interests and durable, sustainable interests that form an alliance. Um, Many Germans would say that the value base are not completely overlapping between uh, America and, 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 and Germany. And I think this also makes it a bit interesting. Uh, when you speak of, uh, of uh, capital punishments and others, um, there, there is still, um, there's still a lot uh, uh, where Americans and, and Germans do not agree. Um, so uh, one has to keep in mind that, that these, these like the discussion about what values are important and, and what, what importance they have must be going on and must be part of a newfound transatlantic relationship when we speak about a renaissance. Um, there was a, a question here on, um, uh, on the NSA scandal. Uh, I think one should, should uh, 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 like separate aspects of it. I find it necessary that secret services cooperate uh, in, uh, in a struggle with um, like trans-border, transnational structures and organizations that can use the most mo modern and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and technologically skilled ways to cooperate. It's necessary that, that secret services cooperate and I'm glad that America has strong secret services to do that. When it comes to um, self-preservation of the services, when the NSA is trying to figure out what the Germans are talking about, when, when, when it comes to reacting to the NSA scandal and so on, I find we, we, we come to a, a a distinction that is necessary to say, um, don't spy on us, spy together with us on others. That would be fine. You can, you can use Germany as a playing ground for your, for your espionage or for your, for your secret, secret uh, service uh, activities when it comes to, to looking at extremist networks here, uh, but, but don't spy on the Bundestag. You know, you, you don't need to spy on democratic procedures that are needed and necessary to uphold political control uh, over, over, over the services. And I think this is, this is um, a consensus that should be made. Um, there was a larger question on the, on the Middle East, what the, the ultimate goal of, of uh, America and, 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 uh, and, um, and Germany is. Um, that would be too much to answer, I think. 
um, the Germans always go for peaceful ways to end conflicts and to, uh, and to, and to go through political conflicts. So a negotiated process in the Israeli-Palestine conflict uh, is, is an ultimate goal, and of course a two-state solution. I think there is a consensus in America and Germany about that. Um, how much would you be willing to, to, to invest, actually, when it comes to fighting groups like ISIS, for instance? Uh, this is in, in the development. I think after Afghanistan and Iraq, the Americans, but also not the Germans, are crazy about going into a long-lasting military operation that will include uh, civil um, responsibilities. So I'm, I'm not very optimistic that there will be an international response very strong to, to a, a phenom phenomenon like, like ISIS, which will give regional states like uh, Saudi Arabia and others um, a hand in the game, which is not n necessarily a good thing. Um, you, you had a question uh, in the back on, on the economic um, uh, crisis and how Germany um, has come out of it. As I said, I'm not an economist, and it's very difficult for me to, to, to answer that in a proper way. And since we have another guest already here, uh, I don't want to take too much of the time. I think it's a good thing that Germany has come out of the crisis in a very strong way, and I would support the German attitude in demanding new structures, s stronger controls of uh, the budgetary policies of the EU members uh, before handing out too much money. And I think this is always showing signs of success here. Thank you.